Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Bite Size PD, Meaningful Movement in Mathematics. Today, we're going to be talking about how you can use movement in your elementary math block to engage with your students. Before we get started, we'd like you to reflect on your students' engagement during your instruction. So think about what does their body language tell you? And I'm Ashley Lennox. I'm your elementary math and social studies specialist. And I am here with Meredith Dolney, our elementary health and PE specialist. You might know her as Coach Mayor. So we've teamed up today to talk through some ways that we can support your students in their math instruction. So on the screen, we have our uh, CSD MTSS framework. Although we felt like you could really argue that everything that we're talking about today, you could do in those, those four columns, the blue columns on the left-hand side, um, we felt specific, we're going to be looking at maximizing our opportunities to respond, and then those positive teacher-student relationships today. So our learning intentions and success criteria, to bring it back to what we discussed at District Day, we have our four modalities of language on that top right-hand side. Today, we're going to be learning how to incorporate meaningful movement strategies effectively into our math instruction to enhance student engagement, understanding, and retention of mathematical concepts. And we will know that we are successful when we can describe the cognitive benefits of movement and have incorporated more movement into your math instruction. So we're looking within those four modalities where this is going to be a lot of speaking as far as how you're going to speak about these things with your students and with your peers. So for the agenda today, we will be going over our CSD math block and those early learning growth goals. We'll talk about why movement matters and distinguish a little bit between the brain breaks and brain boost, and then go through our curriculums and tools such as Envision 2020 and BFF kit examples. So in Canyons, we believe in evidence-based curriculum. So what you can see up here, are these are the reasons why we feel like that evidence-based curriculum or why we know that evidence-based curriculum is so important within our classrooms. This really is our ticket to equity. This is how we make sure that all students have access to that high quality instruction. Um, and so that we know that there is kind of a, a system behind the instruction that's going on within each of our classrooms. Next, we have our math block. These math blocks were created to support you in your instruction and planning as you try to get these standards across to your students in a systematic way. So the first one here is we have our kindergarten math block. Notice that it is 75 minutes long. And then next we have our grades first through fifth math block, which is 90 minutes long. Now, the purpose behind these math blocks is not that students are sitting and receiving instruction for that 75 to 90 minutes, depending on grade level. We wanna make sure that we're really intentional in how we build movement into our math block. Otherwise they will in unintentionally take that time away from you during that instruction. So your brain on math. On the top right hand side, this is one of my favorite books in terms of math research over the last couple of years by Joe Buller, This is Limitless Mind. This is some brain imaging research that came out in 2012. And what we found here was that when we start to equate that problem solving process with fear, when, when students feel panicky during math, we have increased activity in the brain regions associated with fear and decreased activity in the regions associated with problem solving, where this has some implications for us as teachers, especially in mathematics, is that mathematics is based around this idea of problem solving. So we want to give students as many tools and resources to, available to them to increase the problem solving and decrease the fear. And one of those tools we can give them is innately built in with what we already do. So we like to think about why movement. When we think about movement, we think about the benefits of our physical health, so muscle development and things like that. But when we talk about it in academic sense, we actually talk about the benefits for our brain. So when we move and when we exercise, our brains get a lot of benefits. So we have those releases of the serotonin and dopamine. We always hear these things as you know endorphins and making us feel really happy. But that happiness and that relaxed state that comes from movement also supports us with our learning. So we're going to see those enhanced move, moods. We're going to see better retention with memory, but also um, what we like to really push, especially when it comes to mathematics and problem solving is that cognitive flexibility. So we like to say it's not just being a fast mathematician, but being a flexible one. 
And one study that really highlights the movement in our brain activity was one, one that was done in University of Illinois. They took a group of students and split them in half. One right before a test got to sit quietly for 20 minutes, where the other actually went for a walk. As you can see, the areas of the brain that are lit up, that is an engaged brain. And when we're talking about our learners, we want a lit up brain in those areas that support our students with problem solving. And I wanna put a quick little plug in here. The difference between a brain boost and a brain break, oftentimes these are interchangeable because there is a little bit of a gray area, but specifically today, what we're talking about are those brain boosts. So those are going to be the instructional strategies that incorporate movement into learning. So for example, some of you might already use these strategies, Yay! But these are going to be games that might be reviewing content. So something that your students have already learned and now they're getting a chance to review through movement. So things such as using four corners where students get to choose the answer or the category that they're going to be talking about. Um, I'll be going over this or that slides that you can use. Um, if you were lucky enough to play this game at Peaks, but Fast Fingers, where you and a partner will quickly show a set of numbers and whoop, five quickly come up with the sum. The first person to do that wins. Um, so again, bringing some fun and engaging movement to the content that you're trying to teach. Whereas a brain break is going to be more of that structured and short period of time where we're actually giving our students brain a break. So oftentimes um, we like to think of this as the amygdala is the filter to all learning. So we have to give that a rest for us to actually retain what we're learning. So for example, one of them can be taking a hike. Um, this is just allowing your students to get up and move around the classroom, literally just look around, be curious. Um, these can also be things like dance parties or calming your students down with some of those breathing strategies, or again, just times where they're not actually learning, but they're taking more of a time to retain and relax a little bit. So today, again, we're going to be talking more of those brain boost opportunities. And, and to add on to that too, something that's important is that when I talk to teachers sometimes about this, they feel like it's really hard sometimes to get their students back after they give them that brain break. So whereas the brain boost is that way that we're going to extend the learning, the brain break is that time where you're going to kind of give them a break. It's a great thing to do in between two subject areas. Then you kind of bring them down and calm them down. Great. Um, and also, we'd like to highlight that this is a part of um, our Board of Education approves this. So they actually encourage the physical activity in the classrooms to enhance learning. So they understand that movement and physical activity creates better learners. Active students are better learners. So <laughs> beyond recess and PE, we want to encourage you all as teachers to bring in those movement strategies and physical activity into your classroom. And that can be anywhere from engaging activities while transferring in the uh, transferring and transitioning in the hallway, or just like Ashley mentioned, even transitioning between activities. Um, if you need any ideas, hi, that's my specialty. So feel free to always reach out. Um, I'd love to get our students moving more throughout our day. So our early learning growth goals, we are held accountable this year to the state of Utah in terms of these early learning growth goals. And what we're looking for is our first grade students, we have an increase of students that are scoring up at or above benchmark on that advanced quantity discrimination or AQD by 4% from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. This is a very lofty goal. And if you're not a first grade teacher where this still matters to you is that this goal was chosen because of the predictability of that AQD. What we know is that students that are able to reach benchmark on AQD um, have a higher likelihood of being able to access later mathematics because this is really the basis of all place value. So that's why this is so important. And one of the ways that we can use to support that is right here. So this is a game that Coach Mare and I played with a third grade class recently. And on the right hand side, you see the resource itself. These are place value discs is what they're called. You can order them on Amazon or you can just cut them out with cardstock. And what we've done is we've show, we've identified places in every single grade level, the standards where this activity or a variation of this activity would be appropriate. So what we see here is the discs are set up around the room. That's where the movement comes in. And students are going to take turns in partnerships building various numbers. So 
to start with, what we did was we gave the students a number and one partner would go and retrieve the place value disks. The other partner would be prepared to then check the work. So what you can see with this kiddo on the right hand side is they are building the number 103 using one 100 place value disk and three of the ones disk. Okay, so some variations of this you can see here is with those partners, partners can actually choose numbers to give to each other and then they compare numbers. So thinking about that advanced quantity discrimination or that place value piece at all levels, this is something where in the, the middle picture here, the students, one student had the number 55, they gave that number to their partner, the partner gave them the number 40 or 96. They each took turns building that number. Then on the right-hand side, they identified which one was greater. And then we actually had them prove it. So what these students did was they actually started engaging in regrouping and subtracting using the strategy of counting up without being prompted to do so. When we played this game, they loved the choice that was offered with the, within this. There was a lot of challenge that they got to choose rather than me giving them the numbers every single time. And again, what you'll see here is that subtraction piece. And then again, this is where and which ones you would use in each grade level. So you can see kindergarten, you'd be using that ones. First grade, we'd add the tens, so on and so forth. Fourth grade, you're dealing with place value and really setting up that foundation. So you can see kind of where each one of those are. Fifth grade, you're doing it all. So in Canyons, our role as teachers in the state of Utah is to teach Utah core standards. So Envision 2020 is one of the tools that we use to do that. And the Building Fact Fluency Kit is a tool that we use to support number sense acquisition. So over the last couple of years, you've heard many of us talk about the benefits of using that Building Fact Fluency Kit. And the teachers that have jumped into it are really seeing some great outcomes as a result of this. We've gone ahead and we've hooked in that Canvas course for those of you that have not had the opportunity to enroll yet. Let's get you one of those kits so you can do some of these things that we're going to talk about next. So within the curriculum, instead of having this idea of that place value game being used in isolation and choosing random numbers, what we wanted to demonstrate is how you could use the curriculum to pull some of these components in. Students don't have to do the worksheet to demonstrate that they understand something. Doing what we did with those place value disks, you're going to get the same result in terms of that formative assessment. So in this case, the students are asked to identify what number Bill could have written. We know that it's the same number of tens and ones. What could Bill's number be? Students could take turns going around the room, finding those place value blocks, building those various numbers, extending it, um, <clears throat> and then being able to kind of challenge by choice that way. Another example is a fifth grade example. This is from 1-2. This is a higher order thinking question, which is really going to increase the rigor that our students are engaging with. In this case, they have to prove whether or not Dan was correct or incorrect in how he wrote um, this number and and, and then be able to write the standard form of that number. All right, more movement time. So within our BFF kits, there are already games that involve the dice. So if you've already played these games, yay, here's a way you can increase the movement within your classroom. And if you haven't, I highly encourage you to sign up for those kits. Um, so for this game, this is number match. You'll find this in the addition and su subtraction kit. Um, and what students do is they partner up and they get to roll two dice and they pick a number between those two. Once they choose that number, so for example, if I roll and I choose that I'm going to pick the number four and recognize the number four, I then would look up at the screen and choose between doing a set of squats or stretching. What I like about this is I understand depending on when your math block is during the day, some of your students are gonna be very excited to get their wiggles out and do those jumping jacks and do those spins and all the fun things. And other students might have to choose, you know what, I'm ready for some stretching. All modalities of movement are important. So again, going back to even the challenge by choice when it comes to movement, your students aren't just stuck with getting sweaty and doing a bunch of jumping jacks it's important to also stretch our bodies. So just a great example of, again, um, these gifts, if you're looking at them, we have a resource at the end that we can share with you. So you can plug in whichever ones you want. But again, um, your students always having that challenge by choice with the numbers, but also um, recognizing their own body and their movement. Another example comes from the multiplication division kit. So again, um, students very similarly rolling two dice and between those number, not two numbers, finding the product. 
once they find the product, they would then be able to do these motions. And, um, and again, movement and learning and all of this isn't done in isolation. So while some of these are going to be more of that movement based waking up our brains and activating our muscles and all of that, a lot of these also can be very socially for, uh, focused. So you'll see that there's coming up with handshakes or giving high fives, or again, it doesn't just have to be about that physical muscle development. It can be also for fun and for our social connections with our friends. And then switching gears from BFF, um, I love using these this or that slides. As you can see, uh, first of all, this one's going to be one of those low stakes, just having a kind of brain break. But what you do is you create these slides with students making the choice between this or that. So for example, this first one is going to be, which one do you prefer? You can do this right now. Thinking to yourself, do you prefer dogs or cats? Dogs. <laughs> All right. So students will then make the choice and based on what they choose, they're going to do a set of movements. So because I chose dogs, I would then start doing squats. And let's pretend Ashley chose cats. She would then be doing lunges. You can use these for a lot of different fun examples like would you rather go to the beach or play in the snow or have ice cream or tacos? Whatever it is, again, um, just that student, positive student teacher relationship, just getting to know your students in just a fun way and getting them moving, always highly encouraged. But how can we take this or that into the academic level? So for example, subitizing. <laughs> so for your students, you would put this up and you'd give them a couple seconds to once again think which is greater between these to this set of numbers or dots. Your students would then pick a motion to what they think is correct. Now, what I like about this is after you show the right answer, you have a really easy way for a check for understanding. So going back to we understand research shows personal experience shows a lot of students feel that anxiety and fear towards math, not just because of it being fast and being correct and it's black and white, but because of that peer recognition that I am right or wrong or whatever that looks like. So what I love about this activity that I've seen with adults and students doing it is that I am so focused on my own answer and my own motion, I might not notice the student next to me who did choose the wrong answer. So they're quickly able to switch over. And now you can see once again, that check for understanding. It's very obvious when you see some students doing that lunge versus that side bend, which is great. All right, so thinking about that again, using those whole numbers. So in this scenario up here, we have 32 and five hundredths, and then we have 32 and five tenths. This is something that students in fourth and fifth grade get stuck on quite often. And this is a great way to reinforce in less than a minute, right? So this is something that's not going to be this long drawn out activity that you're doing. We're going to put these two numbers up and have that built-in continuous review. So same thing, students are gonna do that same movement once they choose with this or that, which one is going to be less. What I would recommend doing as well is pulling this back to some type of number line. Let's pull it back to some type of manipulative with that representational piece. So students can see where 32 and 5 hundredths is on the number line versus 32 and 5 tenths, or for using whole numbers, 32 and 37, 42 and 65 putting it on the number line so students can see where those two numbers are to identify how they can start to do this for themselves of which one is less than or greater than. I know the answer. Nice. <laughs> Prove it. <laughs> All right, next, um, just a couple of fun ideas that you can do with just chalk and measuring tools. So I know in the, the fall and even in the spring, we have these random breaks in nice weather, or sometimes we wanna get the students out because they've had this string of inside days. This is one way that we can do that. Again, we broke it down by standards. We wanted to be very strategic in pulling in that measurement and data and geometry standards, because those are the two that since they're taught towards the end of the Envision curriculum, it's something that our students don't always have the opportunity to show mastery of. So what you can do um, is, here we go, here's your grades, your standards, and then those are the two tools that you would need in order to do that. What I also like about this yeah. is pulling in that steam. Mm. So I can also probably pull in our art specialist right now that would yeah. love to know that you're encouraging your students to create and draw these shapes. Yeah. And again, practice that fine motor movement of drawing, of creating, and having once again, fun while doing other curricular activities. Mm -hmm. 
So where we can get those again, this is a first grade example from two topics, 13.1 and 14.1. So for example, instead of having students do this in the workbook within the classroom, this could be something that's drawn outside on the playground. I'm sure your junior coaches would love to draw these for your students. And then they can go outside and identify the number of sides, the number of vertices, and then identify the shape. Then on the bottom, you can see that now they're going to take turns in drawing that. So draw a closed shape with zero straight sides, draw a closed shape with more than three vertices. So allowing students to get outside, move. If it's something that you don't feel like you can do because of those inside days, if we have one of those weird springs again, same thing, we could pull out some butcher paper and put this around the gym. Here's a third grade example, those higher order thinking questions, which we all know that I love, same idea, using that chalk if the students can then prove what Jessalyn's shape is based on those measurements and then take turns drawing it. This is one of my favorite things that I think should be in every single one of our elementary classrooms, and that's a life-size number line. So depending on the grade level that you teach in your standards, you might be using whole numbers or you could be using fractions or decimals, depending on, again, what's in your content standards and what your students need. So by having that, some ways that we can use this is students can literally be skip counting, right? So if we're going to do our twos, we can do that two, four, six, eight, and students can skip down that number line as they do the skip counting or hop or hop like a bunny <laughs> exactly um also place value place value is something that our students it's really the basis of our number system what a great way to offer students those additional opportunities to engage in that place value and have something that's around the room for them to move through also adding and subtracting using those various strategies. So what's the difference between 13 and nine? If we have one student stand on nine, one student stand on 13, there's a couple of different strategies that we can use to get from nine to 13 or 13 to nine. And then again, that greater than less than that is what's on the beginning quantity discrimination and advanced quantity discrimination. I know a lot of you just got those test results back and are looking for ways to support your kiddos. This is a great way to do it. So last, what we want to kind of find, you know, kind of summarize up with is this idea of the impact of identity. We want our students in our classroom seeing themselves as mathematicians. That's what they deserve. Um, so thinking through with what we just discussed, what are some ways that you can integrate your, into your practice to increase the mathematics identity of the students in your classroom? Coming back to our learning intentions and success criteria, what we'd love to know is how you are going to communicate some of the things that you learned today with us. So again, if you come across some of these things that you start doing in your classroom and start becoming a regular practice, take a couple pictures and send them to us. We love to see it in action, invite us out. Um, we would love to help you facilitate a game. We'd love to see it in action and be able to kind of give us some feedback as far as how this worked with your students. And here we have linked some resources for you. So we have the indoor recess guide. That time is a coming and it is coming soon um, where we are gonna be having some indoor recess days. So having a plan for that ahead of time is always helpful. So how can we set up our classroom for our students to be able to play during that recess time, which we know that they need and then be able to transition to the learning in the same space. That's something that can be difficult. So that guide is up there. We also have the movement collection that you saw on the this or that's. There's a whole folder of tons of those that you can choose from. We have subitizing cards that you can use for the this or that with the dots. And then the last one is a link to an Amazon purchase for the place value discs, if that's something that you would like to purchase for your classroom. Again, you can Amazon Prime it, or you can also just kind of cut out those circles and fill them in. Both are totally appropriate. And then let's make sure you get credit for being here today. So some important links to remember. We have our Canyons U up there. We have the Canyons U Bite Size PD page, which is where you hopefully found us. And then lastly, if you watched this, make sure that you pull out that final link for your relicensure credit because you deserve credit for being here and learning with us today. Woo! Thank, Thank you so you. much.